Welcome to the Low Carb USA podcast, where we seek to inspire you to help us build this community. I'm Doug Reynolds. And this is Pam Devine. All right, so let's get this going. Gaprit Pada, right? That's the right way to pronounce Gaprit, it? Yep, perfect. Gaprit. Okay, so welcome, Gaprit. Um, I, I was really fascinated by, um, by your story and, and the work that you do. You've been to a couple of our conferences, but I didn't really understand or learn about what you did um, until very recently. Um, you have an organization called uh, Reversing Diabetes MD, and you do a, a lot of work with, you're saying, thousands of patients now to help them reverse their diabetes with this LCHF lifestyle. So um, I think go ahead and just explain to us how it was that you, that you got into this in the first place and, and tell us a whole lot about um, all the patients that you're working with, please. Sure. So um, I'm an interventional pain physician. That means that I treat patients that are sent to me that have profound, chronic, severe pain that's unrelenting. Um, and that's how I started. I, I started in the surgical world. Um, I went into anesthesia and then I went into interventional pain. As I was treating my interventional pain f patients, I came to the conclusion that there was more to it than the fact that they had a degenerative disc or they had a bad joint because it seemed to be a lot more than just a joint pathology or a disc pathology. So as I started to figure this out, I came to the conclusion that it was a systemic problem. It was a metabolic inflammatory problem. And as I tried to figure out what that metabolic inflammatory problem was, um, I looked at a whole host of biomarkers and a whole host of methods to treat. Uh, and eventually settled in on that this was majority hyperinsulinemia. It was excessive insulin, insulin resistance, and severe inflammatory response secondarily. So I started off in the world as an interventional pain physician. I'm also boarded in addiction. So I'm at the common nexus of the pain epidemic, at the nexus of the addiction ep epidemic, and at the nexus of the obesity epidemic, which is hyperinsulinemia. Um, I treat patients in the urban core. We have 11 clinics. We've got over 65,000 active patients. And our number one pathology, our number one thing that we treat beyond everything else is metabolic dysfunction and all of its outcomes. And that includes everything from fibromyalgia, which is really an insulin resistance disorder, uh, to severe polyarthralgia, degenerative joint disease, degenerative disc disease. Um, a lot of these bizarre things that, that, we, that we find in pain management turn out that they're sustained by the inflammatory process. And so that, that's how I ended up in this world. I, I, I started off in very surgical, ended up very systemic and trying to figure out how to get these people better. Okay, that's cool. So, so maybe give us some, uh, some examples of, of uh, some of the patient successes in that that you've, that you've yes. had. So our average patient comes in from the emergency room or from their primary care and they're typically on about 180 to 200 milligrams of morphine equivalent. That means that they're on a lot of opiate. Um, they typically are non-functional. They can't go to work because they hurt so much. They have eroded sleep patterns. They're typically significantly overweight. Um, we're talking BMIs of closer to 40 or greater. Um, and most of them, the vast majority have, uh, even though they may not be diagnosed, the vast majority are diabetic. And I would tell you that over 80% of the patients that we're seeing are diabetic and undiagnosed. And nearly 100% of the patients that we're seeing are, have a hemoglobin A1Cs greater than 5.7. So they're pre-diabetic or diabetic. And even on the ones that have normal blood sugar by hemoglobin A1C, they're hyperinsulinemic. And what that means is they're on their way. Their insulin response is high, so they have a ton of insulin, and that's artificially keeping their glucose is down, but their fructosamines are high and their GGTs are high. So they're on their way to becoming basically pre-diabetic or diabetic. Um, when I got into this, I tried to figure out the, the common elements. And 
at the end of the day, the common elements that, that we came up with and looking at, this is not looking at five patients. This is looking at like tens of thousands of patients. Um, the common elements were that their omega-6 to omega-3 ratios were wrong. They had way too much vegetable oil and they had no omega-3 essentially. So they were eating a lot of processed food. They were hyperglycemic or they were hyperinsulinemic, um, which is essentially the same thing. They were eating high amounts of glycemic load in a constant level and their livers were becoming insulin resistant. And the third major thing that they had is that they almost all of them have some form of leaky gut, whether that's triggered by gluten or gliadin or something else. The vast majority are gluten or gliadin triggered, but there's other things that can also trigger leaky gut. So the three elements were vegetable oil too much, sugar too much, and a leaky gut. If you put those three things together, I can take anybody who's normal and give them chronic pain. I can give them sleep deprivation. I can drop their hormones. I can make them hypogonadic. I can make them suffer and become pre-diabetic in about three months. And, and that's, unfortunately, that's a standard American diet. That's what we feed our kids every single day. Right. But um, so you, it sounds to me like you've got or you've had a lot of success with a lot of patients. But I know that, uh, you know, I've done a, a bunch of a video series with uh, Rob Silas and stuff. And, and he's adamant that, that all of these people are effectively carb addicts. And you talked about um, your experience with, with addiction. Um, so maybe explain to us how you, how you work with, with these patients. To, if, you've got, you know, if you're having so much success, it means that the people are sticking with it. And I think if, if, they're, if they're addicts, that's really difficult. I've had to learn to be a lot more tolerant of people who say it's so hard because I'm not a carb addict and so I didn't struggle. But I've come to realize that there are a lot of people who really do. So um, maybe you could talk to that, maybe help people understand that it's not their fault and that they, that they can yeah. fix this. Yeah, so let's, let's back up one step. How do we know that this is a carb addiction? And I'll tell you. Um, and then I'll, I'll go forward from there and explain how, how we deal with it and why. And there's a couple of things because addiction is one of, one of the things that I deal with every single day. We know that carb, carbohydrate addiction is a primary factor in what's going on. And we know this because of the big food companies. The big food companies produce sugar-sweetened beverages and they use high fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup is a 55% fructose 45% glucose ratio. And that's what's high fructose corn syrup. But that's not what your soda is. Your soda that you get is super high fructose corn syrup. They go out of their way to add even more fructose. They spend money to change the concentration of fructose. So you're getting a 60-40 mix. And the reason why is that fructose activates a different part of the brain than does glucose. Glucose gives you a general sense of well-being, and it kind of is more of a serotonergic effect, whereas fructose is more of a dopaminergic effect, which is more addictive. So we know that if you modulate the food supply and increase the fructose out of proportion to even what it's supposed to be, even what's on the package label, it's more addictive. And we know that that's why they do it. They do it because they sell more product. And so we know that for some odd reason, people love fructose because it activates the dopaminergic system. And you can see that on PET scans and you can see it on radio labeled, on, on, um, on labeled uh, fructose that it specifically goes to the nucleus accumbens and specifically increases dopaminergic production. So we know that the, the cause is there. Now, how do we deal with it? How do we get from point A to point B? Um, my fundamental belief is that addiction is more than simply having a drug with an exposure and then going, oh, I want that drug. And there's two examples of that. There's an example of the rat study that was done where they gave rats the opportunity to drink water or they gave the rats the opportunity to drink water plus cocaine. Cocaine water causes dopamine release. Regular water doesn't. The rats preferentially drank the cocaine water to the point where they overdosed and died. So the conclusion from that study was rats preferentially 
i.e. humans, will take cocaine water to the point where they die. They repeated the study 15, 20 years later, and they used the same cage concept, same water, regular water versus cocaine water, but then this time they gave the rats an enriched environment. They gave them an environment where there were other rats to play with, other rats to have sex with, other rats to go through mazes with. None of those rats died. The reason why is because of loneliness. It's the isolationism of, 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 of addiction. When, when, when somebody becomes addicted, they do it because they're bored. They got nothing else to do and there's no social infrastructure support, which is how I backed into treating these patients. What I did was I realized that if I just simply told them to quit eating carbs, they were just gonna look at me and shake their head yes and walk out and get a candy bar. So instead, what I used was the concept of, I'm gonna to go to them and I'm gonna to go to where they are and I'm gonna to go to the people around them and the people around them and the people around them. So I went to the African American churches. I started that as my nexus. And I went to the thought leaders in the African American churches and I created basically a thought leadership program for them to understand how this worked. And I threw pebbles into this pond. And as each little pebble of information emanated, it created ripples. And where the ripples summate, where people get reinforcement from two or three different ways, then all of a sudden it starts to embed that information. And it became really interesting to me about maybe two years ago, a year and a half, two years ago, I realized that my patients were showing up to clinic an hour before clinic because they were holding impromptu group meetings in our lobby with other patients that were on the journey. And what was happening was it really looks like a revival. I mean, it looks like people are standing up and having a revival in our lobby because they're reinforcing behavior That's so and they're awesome. no longer they, lonely. They, they organized this of their own accord, right? That right. Wasn't they realized... No, I, I didn't organize it. Wow, I tried to go through the churches and they took that and they started teaching other people. And when I got to a critical mass, all of a sudden they're taking the protocols that we provide freely and, and they're, they're sharing those with other people. My, my problem is that by 2035, nearly 100% of the African-American female population is going to be overweight or obese. And within five to 10 years of that, 90% of it is going to be diabetic. And within 10 years of that, two thirds of those people, between one third to two thirds of those people are gonna end up with end stage renal disease, disease and on dialysis. So the cost of care is gonna be, right now it's 1.3 trillion a year. The cost of care is gonna decimate the US economy. I get so that for sure, I believe Me that. changing one patient does nothing. Me changing one group of patients and them changing people does everything. It eliminates that loneliness. And, and that's what I'm trying to get to. If I can get people to not be lonely, then I've actually done something. That's brilliant. So tell me, um, you were telling me earlier before we got started here that um, there's very little or no cost for, for people to, to become a part of this. So if you could just explain to people um, about your organizations, how they can find it, how they can get hold of you um, and learn more about it and maybe um, get on the road to a healthier life. Yeah, so uh, there is no cost to our program. Um, the patients that I directly treat, that I medically treat, obviously we're going through their regular standard insurance, but the entire program is available online for free. It's on our website, reversediabetes.md, www.reversediabetes.md. I spend about $1.5 million of my own money a year that I donate into the program so that we can take care of people. Um, the, that's money that I could take home and put in my pocket, but I don't because I fundamentally believe that if we don't fix this, we're, it, it's a national security issue. It's an issue of, of government. It's an issue of societal function. If we don't make a change, we're decimating our society. Um, I just did a presentation with Exoneration Nation last weekend right over Thanksgiving, I flew out to California and I spoke with people that had been imprisoned for 30 years and they had been imprisoned for crimes they didn't commit and they were coming out. Almost all of them are pre-diabetic or diabetic because they're confined to a specific dietary program through the prison system. And that program 
is based upon the American Dietary Guidelines. Right. That program is rich in vegetable oil, rich in carbohydrates, and rich in things like gluten and gliadin. And it guarantees that that population is pre-diabetic and, and basically pre-cancerous. It, it, it gets them to the point where they're more likely to have si significant systemic disease. And, you know, and we, in our discussion, we talked about how they got there in the first place. How is it that they ended up in prison in the first place? And I would conjecture that the fast food companies and the big food companies specifically target minority neighborhoods, specifically tar target the urban core, and they feed them with processed food because it's heavily subsidized, it's easy to distribute, and it's shelf stable. When they do that, it predisposes those young children to increase ADD and decrease school performance. When you do that, it increases criminality. And I would, I would conjecture that increasing criminality increases incarceration rate, which then decreases political clout for that community. So effectively, the big food companies inadvertently are creating, an, uh, creating a milieu where we're taking voting power away from minority communities. That's a hell of a way of looking at it. That's amazing. But that, that's uh, what I clinically see. Uh, I, I'm so impressed <clears throat> with, with your commitment to, to this whole thing. Um, you know, we, we've been trying to build a community here and, and it seems like you're doing a way better job of that all on your own out there. Um, my hat's off to you. And I thank you so much for being a part of this. I feel like this is the beginning of something because your, your heart's in the right place and your, your mindset is kind of exactly where we are. So hopefully in the end, down the road, we end up doing a lot more together. I really, Great. really, really appreciate what you're doing. All right. Thank you, Doug. Okay, man. You've been listening to an episode of the Low Carb USA podcast. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash lowcarbusa.